Welcome to Attainable Green. I'm Jess and today we're going to be talking about putting in a butterfly garden in my yard. Not only am I trying to add a beautiful pollinator garden filled with beautiful flowers, but I also want to introduce some native plants into this kind of landscaping. There are a few key plants that I like to use to create this butterfly garden. The first plant is going to be milkweed. Um, I'm planting my local native variety, which is the narrow leaf variety, and that's called Asclepias fascicularis. I have about four containers of these plants and it has about uh, six or seven actual individual plants and that should be enough to um, sustain me for the season. The reason why I'm planting milkweed is because this is the core host plant for the western monarch caterpillar. So the western monarch butterfly is probably one of the most popular butterflies in the Americas and um, it's easy to see why because it has this beautiful orange color. They're really large and they travel quite varied distances over their lifespan. Although they are a very interesting butterfly, their numbers are in decline. Um, every Thanksgiving there is a great monarch count where they try to count the numbers of monarchs that are overwintering for the season. And I think last year's numbers were that there were about 2,000 butterflies in the entire uh, state of California. About a couple months ago there was a program that was recently released in California to plant about 30,000 milkweed plants um, throughout the entire state to help boost the numbers of the Western monarch. So this is part of the program to help these butterflies make it because as if the numbers keep dwindling at this rate, um, the Western monarch that is migrating along the California coastline may become extinct in the next couple of years. So that is one of the main reasons why I'm planting milkweed. So hopefully a couple of butterflies will make it from this small stand and eventually I want to create a habitat where it's not only just beneficial for the monarch but for other pollinators as well. Now when it comes to planting milkweed here, there are a couple of considerations to take into account. First, um, we shouldn't plant milkweed within five to 10 miles of an overwintering site. And we can look that up on the Xerxes website for um, where the monarchs overwinter. Supposedly the call of the milkweed tells them that they need to reproduce instead of traveling for overwintering purposes. So if you're at least 10 miles inland, then it's totally fine to plant milkweed. Now, second of all, there's something to note about the milkweed is that that, um, there are these bright yellow aphids that tend to consume the milkweed plant and sometimes they're considered quite harmless. What most people do is they leave it, let the beneficial insects take care of the aphids instead of trying to wash it down or um, use some kind of insecticide to take away the aphids. You want to keep these plants free of any chemicals and as natural as possible. You want to allow nature to kind of take over and work itself out. Now the next plant is the Verbena lilacina. Um, this one is a special cultivar called the Delamina, which has uh, slightly darker flowers than the typical um, verbena that is uh, native to California. I consider this to be uh, kind of a lantana alternative, which is a beautiful nectar plant that provides lots of beautiful flowers throughout the year. So hopefully this verbena lilacina will grow to be a nice small bush um, that stays relatively compact, about two to three feet, and it has these stunning purple flowers that should um, grow throughout the year. The peak flowering season for this plant is spring to summer, but given the climate that we have, it can actually flower year round. So I am hoping that this provides kind of that year round color. I've put the Verbena lilacina in my front uh, patio area. It's in one large planter, and I'm hoping that it'll kind of take over that container and be kind of like a uh, nice, beautiful, attracting um, pollinator plant. Now the next plant is yarrow. This is Achillea millifolium. Now this is a very common yarrow. It's spread throughout most of the United States and it provides this beautiful kind of nice bushy head of flowers and um, it has these kind of fern-like texture in the leaves. I chose this plant because not only is it a stunning plant and it attracts butterflies, but it also attracts some beneficial insects that prey on aphids. So I'm planting this next to my milkweed in the hopes that if aphids do appear, the yarrow will actually attract the beneficial insects that will feed upon uh, those aphids. I got two varieties. There is one that is white and that is the one that is most common. And there's a second one called Island Pink, which is a selected cultivar that has more pinkish flowers. I'm just trying to see which one I like, but so far um, I'm just enjoying the flowers to see how they look in the overall presentation. 
before figuring out um, its exact location. So the next set of plants are nectar plants. And to be honest, these ones are not California natives. These are mostly plants that should do well in my environment. So they may be a Mediterranean plant or ones from a Mediterranean-like environment um, or somewhere close to the area in which I live. So it could be somewhere from Arizona, Texas, that sort of native area, but they do well in the California environment. So I included a couple of these as great pollinator attracting plants because they provide nectar sources they provide um, just a good space and habitat for these plants even though they're not native so I have the Penstemon barbatus which is a beard tongue so it has this tubular flower with a nice fat lip as a kind of a landing pad for butterflies or even the tubular lip for hummingbirds so they do well for both the next one is a pentas and the pentas is native to Africa it's very similar to the yarrow in the sense that it has this nice large cluster of small flowers so that that if a butterfly were to land on it, um, it can just uh, get nectar all at once from just one patch of flowers instead of just drifting from one to another. The next set are salvia. Now I have um, a general blue salvia species. This is considered an annual. And I also have a hybrid salvia, which is the salvia macrophylla crossed with gregii. Now this one is also not native, but they should be able to handle the heat of the California summer. So the hybrid is a little bit hardier. So I'm hoping that this one becomes more of a perennial plant. So most of these plants that are not native I'm trying to see if they will survive for the next year and become perennials or if they're just annuals and they die back then I could try again with more California native plants. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what works best in my place and my area and I'm always learning so this is just a good uh, starting block because uh, I know that these plants do well for pollinators in general but eventually I do want to switch it over so that they're more California native plants. So we talked about the flowers and we talk about the location and why I'm doing this kind of setup. So I have two places where I'm creating this kind of um, wildlife habitat space. And the first one is my front patio. It has these two large planters that I've put in front of my house. And um, I have been trying for about three years now to find something that will grow and stay there for more than one year. And so far I have been pretty unsuccessful. The only things that have survived were uh, chocolate coleus and um, a sweet alyssum. Now both of these are not native and so they have their own issues with uh, the weather here. So I have been struggling to figure out what can grow in these two planters in the long term. I really want to keep them pretty low maintenance because um, out of all the spaces to take care of and all the things to do, the front the front of this house is probably the most neglected. I have to hand water these containers just because of um, how the watering situation is in this house. And because I have to hand water them, they get neglected. So they really have to thrive in basically neglect. That's pretty much why I turn to uh, California native plants because they are more drought tolerant, they're less uh, maintenance, so they're able to handle the harsh conditions of the California climate. Also, with the upcoming drought that we're facing, um, I want to reduce my water usage as well. So by decreasing the amount of water I'm placing on these plants, but just allowing what can thrive to survive, um, I think it just bodes well for me overall. In my side yard, I have about maybe 100 square feet to work off of as a plantable landscape area. And currently, half of it right now is taken over by shelves for my orchids. But slowly, I do want to transition it so that this kind of whole space is kind of dedicated as a California wildlife habitat. And I just want it to be more beneficial for pollinators and just beneficial for me overall to have a little slice of California plants in my own backyard. I think I've been so ingrained with um, having a European style garden or even kind of a Mediterranean desert styled garden that I didn't really think that California natives would do well in a garden or planned setting. But it turns out that there is so much more to learn and so much variety that we have there that um, I'm becoming really interested in this. Um, eventually, I do want this space to be about 70% native plants and then the rest can be um, other things scattered throughout. And I've already made a couple mistakes. I already bought a couple plants that aren't native, but I thought, oh, this is drought tolerant. It looks beautiful. Why not? I'm going to try to incorporate that in and see what works in this kind of space and this setup. So I have a good start on my butterfly garden. I have the pollinator attracting plants that provide the nectar and the beautiful flowers and all of that. And then I'm providing a couple of host plants where they can lay their eggs, where hepatic pillars can grow. And I'm gonna have to be okay with um, some of these plants being consumed and eaten. And 
that's part of the process. So I'm also hoping that by creating this kind of wildlife space, the pests will stay away from my orchids because they have food for themselves and that's much more pleasant than having um, these non-native plants in their area. So when I started this project, I didn't do as much research as I should and it turns out there is a wealth of information and I can't go through all of them but I'll leave a couple of links. Um, the Xerxes Society is great for learning about butterflies and pollinators and how um, the landscaping and how agriculture and everything has been impacting um, how they're doing and how it impacts biodiversity overall. The other one that has been great for me is the California Native Plant Society. Um, they also have a website called Calscape and that's where you can type in either a plant that you're looking for or even your address and they can show you all the native plants that grow in your area. So that is a great jumping off point if you want to dive right into looking for plants. And there are a couple of local California nurseries that do grow um, or do sell California native plants. So I just wanted to share my little project that I'm working on and uh, hopefully that will inspire you to add a little bit of uh, native plants into your gardening landscape and maybe that will help um, boost the biodiversity of your plants overall. Um, it's funny how uh, we're taught that most bugs in the garden are bad, but when it comes to building a native um, garden and even building a wildlife habitat, um, having and incorporating those insects and pests is part of the cycle of life. And it's part of having a well-balanced garden because then you don't have to use all of these chemicals and insecticides and pesticides to keep things in check. The natural environment should be able to take over and balance itself out. And that is kind of just seeing the beauty of what nature can do on its own without having us uh, interrupting and interfering with it. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel, Attainable Green, to follow along on my journey. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.